Welcome back everybody to the Murder, Mystery, and Crime, oh my, TP special. I'm Tarzan. I'm Pedro. So today we talk about the famous case of Brandon Bernard. Who's that? He became the youngest person to be executed by our federal government in almost 70 years. In almost 70 years? On my birthday, December 10th at 9.27 p.m. Very special. So my birthday, I was researching this man who was just murdered. Well, he was killed by a federal government. Yeah. Basically murdered. Basically murdered. So, to be honest, I didn't know anything about Brandon until I stumbled upon Twitter when I saw none other than Kim Kardashian post about him. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, was saying goodbye to Brandon and stating something along the lines of, no one deserves to die. And I think this caught my attention, and it's not because I'm a Kim K fan. I actually prefer Kylie. <laughs> but it's because oh so, someone of that like celebrity status writing about someone on death row is something yeah. that's not often heard of yeah and Kim K, Kim K has done it before and she's actually becoming a lawyer believe it oh, or not what? yeah so she's been advocating for a lot of people's rights especially because she doesn't believe in the death penalty of course especially in this case because she actually knew Brandon and communicated with Brandon for a long time Damn. and this is this is exactly what she wrote the tweet that I saw that got me interested in the case she said, we didn't say goodbye because we wanted to be hopeful that we would talk again. We said, talk to you soon. And then the broken heart emoji. So I'm not, I thought this was the only tweet that she had sent out regarding Brandon's yeah. execution. But I that was not the case. Every hour leading up to his execution, she would tweet. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. multiple times within the hour. So she sent out like more than a dozen tweets. And I'll, I'll put it on the screen right now. Yeah, It's so long. Why'd she do that? I zoomed, I zoomed out as much as I could on my computer. I couldn't capture every single tweet that was about him that day. But she was asking Trump to pardon Brandon. Um, she was saying, she was because she's done that before. Yeah. She got someone's sentence commuted who had been in prison for nonviolent drug offenses. Oh. And she got him out of jail. Like, by herself. Yeah. So she was like, fuck it, like, I'm going to try this with Brandon. Get him not executed, but yeah. she proved to be unsuccessful. Yeah. But either way, she tried, which is pretty cool. But there was a reason they put him to, for execution. Which was? And that's what leads us to the crime. Okay. So on June 20, 1999, Christopher Andre Vialva, Christopher Lewis, and Tony Sparks, members of a gang in Killeen, Texas, okay. met to plan a robbery. And this is the plan that they came up with. Okay. First, they would convince someone to give them a ride. Okay. Second, they would pull a gun on the victim while they were driving. Okay. Then, they would steal the victim's money and personal effects by obtaining the PIN number for the victim's ATM card. Okay. And then, they would force the victim into the trunk of the car, drive somewhere random, in the middle of nowhere, and leave them in the trunk. That was their plan. This is, this is a very bad plan. And it got worse because they didn't go their way, okay. as you'll clearly see. So it's now June 21st, 1999, the day after. Yeah, yeah. So Vialva, Lewis, and Sparks decided, if we're going to get this done, we need some backup. Which is when they recruited fellow gang members, Brandon Bernard and Terry Brown. Then they realized, oh shit, all we have is this tiny 22 caliber pistol. Which is far too tiny to frighten anybody. Okay. We need more firepower. Well, luckily for them, Bernard owned a Glock 40 caliber handgun That's a pretty big one. that he had lend, lended to Gregory Lynch, which I assume is a fellow gang member. Okay. The group got the gun from Lynch and set out to find their victims. Victims. So it's not victim anymore, it's victims? Well, I think it's whichever one they could find. No, it was initially three of them. And then yeah. they contracted Bernard and who else? Bernard and... Terry. Terry Brown. Damn. So there was three of them, and then they contacted two more. And they're all the, part of the same game. This seems like a really bad plan. Well, we'll see. Too many people involved. So court cases have these events occurring a little past 2 p.m. Yeah. Bernard drove Vialva, Brown, Lewis, and Sparks to a local supermarket. Having had no luck there, the group continued their search by driving around parking lots at other local stores. Okay. That was until they stumbled upon Todd Bakley using a payphone. Now, Lewis and Sparks then went up to Todd and asked, hey, can we get a ride to our uncle's house? Todd, being the nice guy that he was, he agreed. He was like, I'll take these kids to, to their uncle's house for Poor sure. Todd. They don't have a house. So I mean, they don't have a car. I'll take them. So 
He agreed not knowing that he had just placed himself and his wife in immediate danger. Oh. So Vyava joined the other two and got in the backseat of the baby's car. Right? So the first the two got in, then Vyalva was like, okay, now I'm going to join in. Wait, so they didn't see him until after the fact? that they Yeah, yeah. so they hadn't seen Vyalva, they had seen the two younger kids. Um... Vyalva was a little older, but they the two kids had asked, and then the Vyalva got in the car with the two kids. So they knew he got in the car, but they, they, they didn't agree. They hadn't seen him when they agreed. Mm-hmm. Which I think was a, a, sort of a smart plan because I think you're more likely to agree to younger kids than you yeah. are to an older Poor man. Child. Okay, well, so far we have the three people in the back seat. Then we have Todd driving and his, and his wife, wife Stacy, in the wife front Stacey. seats. Stacy's got mom's got it going on. No, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, it is that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Viavo was giving Todd directions, and all of a sudden pulled out the forty caliber gun, oh, damn. pointed at Todd, and said, "The plans have changed." At the exact same time, Sparks pointed the 22 caliber handgun at Stacy. Then, on Val- Valva's orders, Todd stopped the car, and the Bailey's got out. They proceeded to steal. The kids proceeded to steal Todd's wallet, Stacy's purse, and the Bailey's jewelry. Okay. Valva demanded the pin numbers for the Bailey's ATM cards, and then forced the Bailey's into the trunk of their car. Oh, so they, so everything went to along with the plan. Everything so far, so far, is going along to the plan. And they did get the pin numbers. They got the pin numbers. It's going pretty smoothly. Going pretty smoothly. I don't like the end of the plan, yeah. but it's going pretty smoothly. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. See, Valva drove around for several hours with the Bagleys in the trunk of their car. Okay. And he went to several ATM machines, but it didn't prove to be worthwhile because the Bagleys only had a hundred dollars in, in their in their accounts. In all their accounts, they had a total of $100. That's awkward. Yeah. So they took out those $100. And then... Basically, they were like, okay, we only got $100. What are we going to do with it? So they went to Wendy's. <laughs> what are you going to do when you have money and you just kidnap someone? You build up an appetite, you're going to go to Wendy's. Go to Wendy's. You go to Wendy's. Get, get that Baconator. You don't finish the plan. <laughs> you go to Wendy's. So Lewis and Sparks used this little money to buy some food. And then after filling up, Vialva... Attempted to pawn Stacy's wedding ring. So he went to a pawn shop and tried to get money for the ring. Okay. But I couldn't find any sources that said he actually sold it. So I imagine he was unsuccessful. So, so far, they have two people in their trunk. Why do you think he was unsuccessful? Uh, there's no sources that said he was. They all said he attempted to sell it. None of them said mm-hmm. he was successful. Okay. So I imagine he did, couldn't sell it. Okay. So, so far, they have $100, two victims in their trunk, and then they just they got Wendy's. They got Wendy's. That's what they've done so far. Well, at least they got Wendy's. Yeah. Going pretty good. So then Vyalva actually also stopped at a tobacco store to purchase cigars and cigarettes. Uh, just have your t- time, bro. Yeah, just, Take your time. They're, they're chilling, bro. Take they're, your they're, time. They're just driving around town, chilling. Bro, bro. What, what's the rush? <laughs> what's the rush? Stop and smell the, the roses sometimes. Exactly. You, and you enjoy your surroundings. <laughs> so while they were locked in the trunk, the vaguely spoke with Lewis and Sparks, which were the two younger kids, through the rear panel of the car. Lewis testified this in court that the Bagleys asked him questions about God, Jesus, and the church. The Bagleys spoke about not being the wealthiest people, clearly with $100 in the bank, yeah. but that they were blessed with their faith in Jesus. The Bagleys then told Lewis and Sparks about the revival meeting at the Christian church, which was actually a church uh, Lewis attended. So urging them to have faith, the Bagleys advised Lewis, advised Lewis and Sparks that God's blessings were available to anyone. And after this conversation, Sparks... Told Vialva, he was like, I don't want to continue this. Oh, damn. Like, these are nice people. Like, I don't want to I don't want to murder these people or steal from these people. Like, I don't want to be included in this plan. However, Vialva was like, these people have seen our faces. Yeah, We've yeah, got to yeah. kill them now. They really messed up on that. Yeah, they're like, they saw our faces. We literally just asked them for a ride. Like, they know our names. At this point, we've been saying them in the car. Like, we have to kill them. So, he said, we have to kill them. And we got to burn evidence. We got to burn the car. We got to burn them. So only way we're gonna get out what of this. The fuck? Yep. That's so intense. Yeah. I thought they were just gonna leave him in the trunk, but they were like, no, we're no, gonna. No, we gotta blow up the whole car. No, they gotta kill him first. And then, then, in order to get rid of all the evidence, they gotta just burn the whole car. But even then, that's not very good. No. Because you still got the remains of the body, even mm. because they're not gonna get fully scored. I mean, like incinerated. I mean, it, I mean, it could if it if it really blew up the car. If they really blew up the car, but even then. Yeah, if you really blew up the car. And you're just going to have bodies at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Like, And it's going to be the Bakley's car. Yeah, yeah. 
So at that point, and if you if they can a, tell that they were in the trunk, you know they're gonna see that it was like, well, yeah, kid, but uh, if abduction, if yeah, abduction. With everything's if everything's burned though, well we'll see, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Right, right, right. So Viavo drove to his house to grab a ski mask and some additional clothing. While he was inside, having been in the trunk for several hours at, the, at this point, the Billies made a final plea for help to Lewis and Sparks for their lives. They've been in the they've been in the trunk for so for Wait, several Lewis hours. Lewis and Sparks. Yeah. So Bernard isn't part of this. Well, right now. Not yet. Okay. They because remember Bernard drove them. Right? All right, 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 right. So then he drove away, left them there, so they can complete the plan. Yeah. yeah. But now it's time to meet back up, right? They Vialva, Lewis, and Sparks then met up with Bernard and Brown, and Vialva re- reiterated that he had to kill the Bagley's because they had seen his face. Bernard and Brown then set out to purchase fuel to burn the Bagley's car. Okay, so was... Bernard and Brown are now fully included. Very bad. They drove them to the victims, and yeah. now they're getting fuel to yeah. burn the car. Now, Vialva, Bernard, and Lewis, and Brown then drove to an isolated spot in the Belton Lake Recreation Area on the Fort Hood Military Reservation. Vialva parked the Bagley's car on the top of the hill, which is like, I don't know why you're parking at the top of the hill. I'd imagine it's very yeah, visible there. Very visible. But whatever. But whatever. Brown and Bernard proceeded to pour lighter fluid on the interior of the car while the Bagley sang and prayed in the trunk. So he's so Bernard is literally putting fuel everywhere, and you just hear singing and praying yeah, from the yeah, trunk. Yeah, yeah. Very nice, very nice. So according to Brown, Stacy's last words were, Jesus loves you, and Jesus takes take care of us, which is sort of beautiful. Until Again. you realize that Valva then cussed them out. <laughs> so she was like, I love Jesus, like, be, like take care of us. And then Valva was like, shut the fuck up, whatever. Ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba. Yeah. Da-da-da. So Valva put on his ski mask and told Lewis to open the trunk. Yeah. As Lewis opened the trunk, Valva quickly shot Todd in the head with a forty caliber handgun, killing him instantly. He was instantly dead. And then... I don't like where this is going. Valva continues to shoot Stacy in the right side of her face. Which knocked her unconscious, but didn't kill her. Oh, no. Which proves to be an important point later on. That's right? That's Allegedly, bad. she's still alive. Allegedly, she's still alive. So Bernard proceeded to set the car on fire. So Bernard put the lighter fluid in the car, set the car on fire. Velva shot both of the victims. Killed Todd. Did not kill Stacy, allegedly. Right? So Velva, Bernard, Lewis, and Brandon. No, Velva... Vielva, Bernard, Lewis, and Brown ran down the hill to Bernard's car. They were at Bagley's car. That's the one they're burning. Yeah, they're going yeah, yeah. down to the getaway car. I do want to know yeah. that he put a ski mask on. I don't know why. <laughs> like, I don't know why. Like, hold up. Like, hold up. I went through this whole plan with how ski mask. They know my face. That's why I'm killing them. Mm. Just let me put on my mask real quick to kill them. Just Maybe it's like a getaway thing. Like, I don't want anyone to see us <laughs> doing the actual killing and burning of the car. But uh-huh. he was the only one. Well, that's what that's what I read in the report, but it might have been like everyone had a mask already or something. I would hope so, because if not, it just doesn't make any sense. Makes no sense. But okay. Yeah. True. Well, they thought they were going to get away until their car slid off the road into a muddy ditch. <laughs> yeah. And then local law enforcement officers who had been informed of a fire <laughs> arrived at the scene while the four were trying to push the car out of the ditch. <laughs> Fucking idiot. When firemen discovered the bodies in the trunk of the Bagley's burning car, they were all arrested. Right? Yeah. They see a ditch. They see people pushing a car out the ditch. They're like, okay, weird. But whatever. Crazy. Then they keep going going down the road. They see a, they see the burning car and dead bodies. They're like, okay, we just saw these people clearly trying to get away. Yeah. Put two together. Arrested all of them. Right? Now, Todd Bagley and his wife, Stacy, were youth ministers from Iowa. Before moving to Iowa, Todd had been stationed at Fort Hood, where the couple attended Grace Christian Church and worked with their youth group. About a week before their deaths, the Bagleys returned to Killeen to visit friends and attend a revival meeting at the church. On Sunday, June 21st, they attended a morning worship service and had lunch with friends. Afterward, Todd stopped at Mickey's convenience store to use the payphone while Stacy waited for him in their car, and the rest, well, you know. Yeah. These were two seemingly Normal. really good people. Normal people. They loved Jesus, loved the church, were nice. They saw these kids that needed a ride, gave them a ride, and what did they get? They were murdered and set on fire. Yeah. Stacy was set on fire alive. Yeah, which is all fucked up. Yeah. 
Like, these were good people that died. So, the important detail of Stacey being alive means that Bernard killed, they technically murdered her. Yeah, and we'll get to that. Yeah. So, the, this this is the outcome of the case now. We know what happened. Yeah. This is the outcome. Okay, so Christopher, Christopher Bialva was sentenced to death and was executed earlier this year. That was the oldest one of them. Yeah, yeah. He was the mastermind. He was the one who ch- took the shots. He was mastermind. the one who made the plans. Mastermind? Well, mastermind in this case. Mind? Master. Mind. Yes. Leader mind. He, okay, <laughs> he was the leader. He was the ringleader, okay? Leader. No mind. Literally no mind. Okay, but he was the leader. <laughs> now, he was, he was executed this year in September. All right. Terry and Christopher Lewis were both 15 at the time of the murders and have yeah. already been released from prison. All right. They were young. They were following orders. Yeah. They didn't do any of the killings. They were yeah, extremely yeah. young. They, they've already, they're, they, they're out. Hopefully, they're changed their lives. Yeah, hopefully, they changed their ways. They yeah. figure it out. Yeah. Let's hope so. Now, Tony Sparks, who was 16 at the time, is set to be released in 2030. He was, more invo- he was found to be more involved in the crime, so he's being released in 2030. All right. He's 16. And as we know, Brandon Bernard was executed December 10th, 2020 by lethal injection. And that's because of what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is why people are talking about this case. Maybe it seems like a clear case to you if you support the death penalty. And the original autopsy for the bodies had revealed that Stacy died from smoke inhalation and not the gunshot wound inflicted by Vialva, which would make Brandon Bernard, who set the car on fire, a killer and not an accomplice. Yeah. However. However. An independent medical examiner hired by the defense team determined after the trial that Stacy was medically dead after being shot before the fire started. And this is according to CBS News. Which means that he would not have killed Stacy, but helped get rid of evidence. Yeah. Which would probably would have gotten him life in prison and not death. Which I think is why a lot of people were saying this was a young man. He was 18. A lot of the trial was saying that he was he was scared. He was just following orders. Imagine you're 18, you were in a gang. Yeah. And then this, and we'll, we'll keep talking about it, but his legal team alleged that the government withheld evidence that could have been influenced the jury into sentencing Bernard to life in prison instead of death. Now, expert evidence that Bernard occupied the gang's lowest rung would almost definitely have persuaded at least one juror to vote for life, the court filing argues. Yeah. So he was he was on the bottom tier of the gang. He was just following orders at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. He was barely involved until the very until the he was only involved in the mm. beginning, which was a drive. Yeah. And then at the end. And he never meant to kill anybody. Yeah. Like he wasn't the one who had the idea to kill someone. He just was helping get rid of the evidence, was just following orders. And honestly, in that situation, you're kind of like scared for your own life. Yeah. You're like, you know, this dude's like ready to kill two people. Yeah. You know? And if I don't agree with him, mm. who knows what he'll do to me? And that's exactly what he said. He was like, I was scared. And he's only eighteen. Which 18 is technically the legal age of a, when you become an adult, according to, like, the yeah, state. the state. But that's still very young. Still very when young. you're 18, you're still figuring shit out. Yeah. Which, of course, you shouldn't be, like, burning You shouldn't people. be burning cars and people. Well, you know? when you're in a gang and, like, you're a young kid who... You kind of, like, you grow up in that lifestyle, you know? You, yeah. don't, you don't really know anything... Better, or you don't see yourself getting out of that situation anytime soon, and you mm-hmm. know that's all. That's what you see yourself doing for a while, and you're now. Yeah, exactly. So after after the jurors who had sentenced him to death heard about the fact that he was on the lowest scale on the sort of tier list for yeah. gang members in that gang, five of the nine jurors who are still alive have come out to say that they regret sentencing Brandon to death, and some even advocating for his sentence to be altered to life in prison. Stating that he was merely a scared kid following orders and wasn't the mastermind behind the events that occurred on June 21st, 1999. Even the prosecuting, prosecuting attorney, Angela Moore, who originally fought the sentence Brandon to death penalty, has come on and said that she's changed her thoughts on the case because the legal reasons, and this is quote, quote, the legal reasons aside from my personal beliefs, it's the evidence and what we have found out since, Mr. Bernard did not shoot and kill the victims in this case, he was not the person who planned this robbery gone wrong. He should not be executed ever. It's barbaric. It's horrific. And he does not deserve it. End quote. End quote. Brandon's last words directed to the Bagley's family, according to the poor reporter present at the execution, right before he died, was, I'm sorry, he said. That's the only words that I can say that completely capture how I feel now and how I felt that day. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to add a little part. Now, this was the family's reaction to the death of Brandon. The family of Todd and Stacy Bagley, right? Yeah. And I'll, I'll put this on the screen as well, and I'll have links to it on our Instagram, on our description. You can go look at all of this. So this is, this is from the family. This is from Charles Woodward, family and friends. On June 21st, 1999, our lives were changed forever. Because this is the day that Todd and Stacy were executed. Todd and Stacy were full of life and love and proudly served the Lord as Christian youth ministers. Even after being forced into the trunk of their car at gunpoint and driven around for over seven hours, Todd and Stacy still managed to provide still managed to provide the plan of salvation to their attackers until they were shot and burned beyond recognition. Stacy still had the chance of survival until the car was set on fire. And then they include um, Romans 10.9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I pray that Brandon has accepted the Christ as his Savior, because if he has, Todd and Stacy will welcome him to heaven with love and forgiveness. God will forgive us for our sins, but the consequences of our sin will always play out. My family would like to thank President Donald Trump, Attorney General William Barr, Assistant U.S. Attorney Mark Frazier, Warden Tom Watson, Warden Brian Lamer, and Terry Hawk Crisis Support Team, Charles Woodward Family and Friends. So they, until the very end, they weren't backing down on the death penalty, huh? Yeah, no, they were like, we need to see him dead before we are happy. We need to see him death before, before we can move on. They even think Donald Trump, which is like, what the fuck did he that's do? That's so hypocritical. That and that's mm. that's the thing. It's like the big Christian thing is like forgiveness, right? It's not eye for an eye. No, you for you live and forgive. Yeah, that's Turned what you do. The cheek, stuff like that. Yeah, and it's like. But these people were like, no, we need to see him dead. We need to see yeah. him die before we are happy. And here's the thing, Brandon Bernard in prison, the twenty. Plus, year that he had been in prison, he was a model prisoner. Never got into any fights, never got into any problems. Was talking to kids about how they shouldn't get into gangs, how they shouldn't be involved in that life. Yeah. Like, he had truly been reformed. And even if you would have given him life in prison, he, would, he wouldn't have harmed someone. Yeah. There was no way that he, he would have brought able, any more yeah. harm to anyone outside. Yeah. And then, there's, that wasn't even the only quote. Now, this is another quote by George A. Bagley, Family and Friends. Which I think this one is even might, might even be worse than the first one. The family of Todd Bagley would like to thank President Donald Trump, Attorney General William H. Barr, Department of Justice. Without this process, my family and I would not have the closure needed to move on in life. It has been def- they're very difficult to wait 21 years for the sentence that was imposed by the judge and jury on those who cruelly participated in the destruction of our children to be finally completed. The local news gave one of my statements and I appreciate the way they presented my quote. When someone deliberately takes the lives of others, they suffer the consequences of their actions. This senseless act of unnecessary evil was pre- premeditated and had many opportunities to be stopped at any time during a nine-hour period. This was torture as they pleaded for their lives from the trunk of their own car. Please remember that the lives of the family and friends were shattered and we all grieved for 21 years waiting for justice to be finally be served. Thank you to all of those who were involved in the process of getting justice for Todd and Stacy. These people were legit waiting 21 years with hate in their heart. To murder this what person. What do you get? What do you no, get? Nothing. You don't. They were like, we can't move on until this person is dead. That's that grief that that thing that they have. It's not gonna go away with somebody dying. Yeah. You know? I what they did was fucked up. Yeah. Todd and Stacy should yeah, still yeah. be alive. They should still have never alive. died. That should have never happened. Definitely. But at the same time, you're not gonna get anything from killing Another Brandon person. Bernard. Yeah. There was nothing you got out of that. Especially with all the evidence that come out. The fact that the prosecuting attorney said that they would have reduced it to life in prison and not the death penalty. Yeah. Five out of the nine jurors. Everybody regretted what they did. Everyone <laughs> regretted with all the evidence that was available, everyone regretted it and they all asked for a new case. Yeah. But he was still murdered. And that was the big part of why everyone was angry was yeah. because they don't think he deserved to die. Yeah. And after hearing the evidence, I don't think he did either. Honestly. And then the family came out, thank Donald Trump. And Which he didn't do anything. Well, here's he, here's what he's what he did do. This was this year, I think marked the first year in seventeen years that someone had been executed. They stopped executions for seventeen years. Up until this point. Where and then 
and I it was some it was something crazy that in the transition of presidents for a long ass time I don't know the exact amount of, amount of time but there hadn't been like the execution of anybody during that period because it's it just understood that when you're transitioning you shouldn't be doing that kind yeah, of you shit you shouldn't be doing but Trump said fuck it and did it anyway yeah he's like fuck it. this man yeah. And that's the case of Brandon Bernard and why everyone was angry at the world. That's why Kim K was fighting for justice. Well, I mean, now that everything's happened, I hope he can he finds his peace in whatever it is after, you know? Yeah. And I hope this family, you know, that decided that that killing him was the best option for everybody. Mm. I hope they they figure out their own peace. Yeah. Because they don't we don't need that negativity out there in that world in the yeah. world. I honestly think I, I just think as long as everyone involved like I don't know, it just sucks that he had to die. Yeah. Yeah, I don't wanna say, oh like let's move on or oh, let's pretend yeah. it didn't happen. I definitely don't wanna say that. Yeah, no. I feel like we should learn everybody should learn from this mistake. But I I mean I do hope the family of Todd and Stacey I I don't know, like to justify what they did at least and are able to move on from yeah. this death that occurred 21 years ago. Hopefully they did find what they said they were going to find. So Tarzan, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, that's all me right here. Okay, let me see. That's not it. So fucking dramatic fucking page turning. <laughs> that's not it. <laughs> Alright, here we go. So what you need to know is six robbers from Ohio go to Cali, steal money, and Nixon. That's basically it. That's Wait, what? what? Did you say Nixon? Notes. Yeah, Nixon. That's what my notes Like the say. President Nixon? Yeah, like the President Nixon. That's what my notes say. That's all you need to know. Um, I think I think we might need to know a little bit more than that. You think so? Uh-huh. Just, a, just a little bit. Oh. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I missed the page. All right. All right. So, imagine this better. Okay. You're going to work Yep. as a banker. Okay. Super fun. Super yes, fun. Yes, very you're excited. Suitcase. You're opening the doors. Yeah. Little you suit, walk little in. Tie. Mm-hmm. You walk in. Cement over the ground. Hole in the ceiling. Just a mess. Wait, cement? Cement. Well, like wet cement? From No, no, no. Oh, oh. Dry cement from the roof. Oh, okay, okay. Like reinforced Wait, cement. you use cement on the roof? Yeah, it's reinforced for the bank. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about that? What are your thoughts? Someone fucking robbed the place. What do you mean? Oh, damn. How'd you know? <laughs> okay, I didn't know. Uh, sure. I, I, think, I think the title gave it away. <laughs> well... Let's take a step back. Okay. All right, all right. And let's take it back to January 1972 mm-hmm. in Young, Youngston Town, Ohio. I think that's how it's said. That's a great town. All right. Great. I, lo- I actually right. love that place. They have all a great right. apple pie. To Emil Denzio, a notorious bank robber. Brilliant. Brilliant guy. Okay. All right. He's before... Before now, mm-hmm. before January nineteen seventy two, yeah, he's acu- he's robbed several banks across the country, mm-hmm. and he's accumulated like twenty million. Okay, in the 70s. twenty million. Wait, in the seventies, that's a fucking shit ton of money. How much money is that in current money? A lot. No, no, I need an exact number. Uh, Did like, you not write this down? No. What kind of fucking reason? No. <laughs> I thought you would know the inflation. You know. Okay, so inflation, you count the one percent, two percent, three percent. You multiply by five, divide by two, and subtract the three. That's a ton of money. <laughs> Glad we can agree. Okay. All right. And his MO for robbing mm-hmm. these banks yeah. was basically him and two other people yeah. would go to a bank mm-hmm. at night yeah, when nobody was there. Mm-hmm. So we, they would have a They don't go during the day when there's other people there? Exactly. That's kind of yeah, smart. Too. Exactly, right? I would have gone during the day. See, and you'd, you would have been wrong. Mm-hmm. And basically, they have a driveway who is also the lookout. Yeah. And the two people uh, take off the alarms and go inside the bank, rob the place, and then leave before anybody gets there. Wait, wait. Who take? There's two. Wait. You said two people take off the alarms? Yeah. Well, like one person. Well, they like both take care of the alarms, uh-huh. and then they start robbing the place. What about the third person? The third person's a lookout uh-huh. and a get getaway driver. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's basically their MO. And then he's. He's uniting a crew, you know, usual mm-hmm. stuff, usual stuff. Yeah, the little montage at the beginning little, of the movie. Do, 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 do. Like, I know a guy. Yeah, and it has a little stats like, rob 35 banks, hates his mom. Exactly. 
Mm-hmm. And then his crew consists of his brother, James mm-hmm. Dinzio. I, I believe that's how their last name is pronounced. Mm-hmm. Which is like his like go-to guy. His like long-time accomplice. Okay. His nephew, Harry Barber. Okay. His brother-in-law, Charles M- Mulligan. Mm-hmm. An alarm expert, Phil Christopher. Mm-hmm. And Charles Bro- Brokell. Did you say Harry Barber? Harry Barber. That's a very <laughs> ironic <laughs> name. I never, I didn't notice that until you said you it. You didn't notice no. the Harry Barber? Yeah. It's because there's so many things that, you know, that was the least of my worries. <laughs> that, like, like, you're going to see why. Okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. And they, he goes to them and informs them. Well, he goes to some of them. They mm-hmm. all unite. And he's like, you know, I just got this hot tip. You know, okay. it's an appar- appar- opportunity that we cannot miss. All right. And they're like, down. All right. It's a setup. You wish it was. <laughs> okay. They're in Ohio, right? Okay. But well, we jumped to March 1972. Okay. It was a couple months later. Okay. So it was, we were in January and we jumped to March? Yeah. Okay. 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 March. And the guys are just chilling in a condo that they rented, you know? Just mm-hmm. chilling, going to get the tools that they need for their upcoming plan in okay. California. All right. In, hold on, hold on. in Laguna Niguel. California. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're just catching up on the good times, you know, taking it easy while they wait for Emil to arrive in California. Emil, the the leader of the crew, right? So everyone's in California except for the leader. Yeah. Everyone's in California except for the leader. All right. And he gets there. Mm -hmm. He gets there. Everything's, they have all the tools. They have the getaway car and everything's, and they have the plan down. Yeah. All right. Which is their basic MO. And on March 24th, 1972, they show up to the United Bank of Cal... No, the United California Bank. Yeah. In Laguna Niguel, California. Okay. All right. And in the middle of the night, dead of night, you know, mm-hmm. they they use these... Egg- Wait, were there no security guards back then? I guess not. They... Why are there security guards now? Yeah, I... I'm not sure. Cause, I mean the I mean I, the, I imagine the local banks like they don't have some. I think like, I don't imagine like the downtown bank that we have. I don't think they have security guards at night. Yeah. But I imagine like the bigger big banks like those must have twenty four seven. Yeah, this security. was a small town. Okay. okay, this was a small town. Yeah. So yeah, that's why they, they didn't have like super security. Mm-hmm. But what the the major detail is what makes it so interesting. Right? Okay. Okay. But they use this expandable phone. On the mm-hmm. alarms, which are like bells. Yeah. And they just use the phone so they can't, so they don't make noise, so they can't move. Mm-hmm. It's the stuff that you use for surfboards when they, when you need to fix them. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, I definitely don't know what that is. Yeah, right. I didn't know what it was, but when you mentioned surfboards, I definitely knew what that was. <laughs> I definitely knew what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. It's because the only reason I know that. Is because a whole surfer article was on it, mm-hmm. just so they could mention that part about what the, the hell? Phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and then after they're done with the alarms, they go up to the roof, mm-hmm. set up explosives, and they blow the roof. Okay. Just boom, middle of the night. <laughs> yep. Okay, so that makes sense. Now they have their entrance. Wait, how did they this? What? How did? They... Why did they blow up the roof? Wait. Okay. Where are the are the alarms outside? Yes, the alarms are outside. So there's no... Okay, so the alarms are outside. They disarm the alarms first. Then they make their entrance. Exactly. Okay. This is a... Okay, I should probably be more specific. This is a Friday night. What does that change? That changes the schedule of the bank. Okay. So mon- banks are usually open Monday to Friday. Mm-hmm. So this is... Oh, so that means they're not going to open the next morning. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So Friday night, uh-huh. they blow the roof. Okay. And you're probably thinking, how the fuck did nobody hear that? Mm-hmm. Right? Well, they, well, Harry Barber explains that they put some, they use a method of putting sand over the explosive to muffle the noise. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. That's actually pretty smart. Yeah. Um, and they just eat the roof. Um, they ne- they spend the next few nights just raiding the place. Just oh, it's just they're just going back and forth, back yeah. and forth. So they go the night only yeah. on, at nights, uh-huh. and that's why they the reason that they blew the roof. So yeah. they couldn't see, so people wouldn't pass by oh. to see them from the building. And, mm. and no one was going in because the bank was closed. Yeah. And they w- they always had somebody look having a lookout, mm. just so they would know they're not 
walk into a setup the next night. Damn. So they have Friday. They have like they have Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night to yeah. take everything out. Yeah, they take out whatever they can from the safe mm-hmm. for or the na- the main vault, and from specific safe safety safety deposit boxes. Wait, are they blowing up these like vaults too? No, they're, they're using open. they're using customized for the vault. They use a blowtorch because they were like railings okay. before. And that, and for the the safety deposit boxes, mm-hmm. they're using customized uh, sledgehammers. Oh damn! Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. And they open five hundred deposit boxes. Okay. Well, that's what one article says. Mm-hmm. And they get away with around twelve million. Okay. Certain certain websites say nine million, and then Harry Barber himself, which is uh, the nephew, mm-hmm. he says that he feels like it was more money, but yeah. you know. The FBI knows better. Yeah. That's his quote. Okay. So th- that means they got caught. At the one point, they did get caught. Okay. But they did get away that, that weekend. They okay. got away. Okay, okay. Yeah. And... But who did they steal the money from? What do you mean who did they steal the money from? Who do you think they stole the, stole the money from? What do you mean? Who... Wait, but it was a bank. They stole the money from the bank. None other than President Nixon. Oh shit, President Nixon had his money in that bank? Yes. But it was so, during his attempt to be reelected, he was uh-huh. trying to get, he was um, getting money from, from lobbyists and he was like extorting them to give him more money. Like, mm-hmm. for example, um, he got $3 million from the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, yeah. which is a union. Okay. And the union... And it was also they could get their union leader out of jail, Jimmy Hoffa, mm-hmm. because he was because uh, president was gonna give him a, pre- a presidential uh, pardon. Oh, sure. So they're like, in exchange for all the money you're gonna give me, I'll get your president out of jail once I become president with your help by the money. Exactly. Oh shit, that's extortion. Yeah. Is that what? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there was other lobbyists that he mm-hmm. got. Like there was the milk money mm-hmm. that he was. I love me uh, some milk money. He was extorting like dairy, um, dairy um, companies. Okay. I didn't read too what, much what into did, that. I was gonna say, what did they get out of it? Yeah, I didn't read too much into okay. that. Yeah, but because I the and main, that is how you we got almond milk. The important part is the Jimmy Hoffa leader. Okay. All right. And because Jimmy Hoffa got thirteen, he was thir- going into thirteen years in jail mm-hmm. for bribery and jury tampering. Yeah. Yeah, and so the top tip that Emil got was that there was thirty million of Nixon mo- of Nixon's money mm-hmm. in that bank. Yeah, and that's why they were like, oh, "Gotta get there," and they were yeah. like, "Nix uh, Nixon's a thief anyway," and yeah. so like, it's basically like, "Wait, who did you get the tip from?" Oh, oh, see, I'm thinking, oh. I'm thinking. I knew you guys were thinking it too. Yeah. And they were like, D- Nixon's a dick anyway, so yeah, he's yeah, he's an asshole. But the hot tip is unknown. But the theory is, from one website, is that it was the same guy that he gave a presidential pardon to, mm-hmm. Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah, because he he wasn't allowed to be a union le- leader anymore. Mm-hmm. He wasn't able to be a union leader, and so yeah. that pissed him off, and so he got. A mill to rob the bank, so he could get his money back. That's one of the theories, but not, there's only one website that supports that. Oh, so it was like a deal between Hoffa and Emil that would be like, if, I'll let you, I'll tell you some info if you give me some money, the money that we gave back. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Yeah, but that was like, that's the one of the theories. But like, mm-hmm. I'm guessing it's like a snitches get stitches type of thing. Mm-hmm. So they don't want to fess up their one. The one tip, okay. their inside guy, and then, and then they also thought nobody wants that money. Nixon doesn't want people to know about that money, so like nobody's gonna go after them. Mm-hmm. Well, they were wrong. The guys they sent like one hundred twenty five FBI agents after them. Jesus. When usually for bank robbers they send like five or six. Well, to be fair, he yeah he was a very popular bank robber. <laughs> he had done a lot of. <laughs> Yeah, but Nixon, but like he hadn't gotten caught for anything. Like yeah. they couldn't connect him to any of them. But they had him on on the radar. Like they were like, this guy's fucking sort of, sus. Sort of. Okay. Yeah, but um, but how did they find out that it was them to send out 125 FBI agents? Well, they didn't know it was them specifically. Yeah. But Nixon was like, oh, that's my money. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know who stole my money, but they stole my money. And so he okay. sent him after it. But he, di- he didn't claim that it was his money. You know? Okay. It was like, oh, like, oh, it's not my money. But, you know, I'm very invested in this mm-hmm. money. Okay. All right. And they got, and what had happened was in their condo, mm. in the dishwasher, okay. there was fingerprints. What the fuck? And in the getaway car, there was there was fingerprints in the battery. Jesus. Nowhere yeah. else? Nowhere else. No. So, they were in a condo. Nowhere else were there fingerprints. Somehow there was fingerprints in the dishwasher? Yeah, yeah. They were very meticulous. They didn't, they didn't leave any proof in the site of the crime. Mm-hmm. Anywhere else. They just got... The only thing that they could get on them was that they, were, they took a flight... Over there to mm-hmm. California, and that old men were there, and those fingerprints. Damn. And Emil, um, Emil himself says that they plant that F- the FBI planted that those fingerprints, hmm. because he was like, no way. Yeah, no way. No, no. I've been doing this for twenty five years. Basically, he was doing it for a long time. Yeah, and I've never left fingerprints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they also had, and but though and within the, like three months, they all got, most of them got caught. Yeah. The only one that didn't get caught was Harry Barber, the mm-hmm. nephew, who was on the room for like eight years. God and he damn. was in Pennsylvania. He would send like postcards and stuff from Long Beach, from Miami, and stuff mm-hmm. like that, to throw the people off the yeah. track. But eventually, he did get caught. At that point, if you have millions of dollars, why don't you just leave the country? Pretty hard. I don't know. Probably didn't know how to get a fake password or something. When it was the seventies, I, I don't know. I can't imagine it'd be too hard. I it mean, now like, now it's it'd be fucking impossible. I would imagine. Okay. Yeah, I guess he could have just driven over the border at some point. Yeah, right. But he probably didn't want to start life over or something. Yeah, that's right. He probably he probably had the connections here or something. Yeah, but yeah, in Pennsylvania, and he got to the FBI's top ten most wanted. Harry Barber. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So they were like, he was up there. And they had it. The FBI also had a snitch. What do you mean a snitch? They had somebody uh, snitch that snitch, snitched them out. The rest of the crew. Oh, but it was one of the crew members. Honestly, that's not gonna say snitching is the right thing to do. That's a smart move if they think they're gonna get caught anyway, and they have evidence yeah. against them. It was Brockell. Oh damn! Did they get out earlier or anything? Did they, they cut got a, deal? a pardon? Yeah, they cut a deal. But he had committed another crime, and that's why he got he cut a deal. Oh, damn. What yeah. was the other crime? I think he committed murder or something. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Initially, he wasn't supposed to be with them. Yeah. Neither was the bomb expert. Mm. But, but there's a bomb expert? Yeah. Oh, no, the, the alarm expert. My bad, my bad. Oh, you the said, alarm. you said, bo- I, was, I was like, bomb my expert? Bad, my bad, my bad. Yeah. The alarm expert. Okay. okay. The brother is pre- very proficient in bombs, and that's okay. why they were able to blow the fucking... So everyone went to jail. Yeah. And the, the snitch went to jail too? No, the snitch did not go to jail. He got a witness protection program. So, you're telling me the snitch murdered someone, robbed a bank. Did they didn't have to give any money back, you know? Uh, th- yeah, whatever money they could find, they mm-hmm. got back. Yeah. But they never got where I would find all the money. I'm sure some of the money, he just he found a way to keep it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, Brockell was a snitch. What the hell. Mm-hmm. And then, after 30 years, Emil got out. Yeah. He wrote a book. Inside the Vault. Yeah. That's a book, Inside the Vault. It's about his experiences with that. He does say that he does have some regrets. Did he Did he make the New York bestseller list? Um, no. I didn't, I didn't, even, I don't think so. Did he, he did he even, do you, do you think he made a lot of money writing this book? Probably not. Damn. It wasn't that. Fucking sucks. Maybe anybody who was from the 70s and 80s, they probably yeah. heard and like saw it and they were like, ooh. Mm-hmm. But yeah. But maybe he will now. Oh, maybe he'll better give me some advertisement money. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and he does say he has some regrets. You know, going to jail kind of takes you away from your family. You know, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And I guess you do have. I would have some regrets for having nonviolent crimes. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And then Harry Bar- Barber eventually, once he got out of jail, he talked about it once his mother died, passed away, because <laughs> he didn't want his mother to be bothered by all the fucking journalists and stuff like that. Yeah, the media. But eventually he did, like, uh, talk about what he did and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And they did make a movie about his part that, well, like, it, he was the main character Not in damn. the movie. Okay. Yeah. And it's called Finding Steve McQueen. And it came out last year. Finding Steve McQueen? It's Finding Steve McQueen. What the fuck? 
Yeah. Wait, was that about the bank robbery? Yeah, about Who's that. Who's Steve bank McQueen? Robbery. I don't know. I think it was ba- it was somebody that he liked watching in another movie. In other movies of the time, of oh, the 70s. What the fuck? Okay. I don't know. And here we are now, talking about this. Are you going to casually have a penis on the back of your oh, notepad? Oh, did I have that? Oh, my bad. Fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching. That was a case of the execution of Brandon Bernard. And the case of the United, United California bank robbery. <laughs> Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week with a regular episode.